Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. From Matthew 27, verse 31. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Here ends our text. Now, it was February 5th that the Indiana Pacers hosted the Los Angeles Lakers this year. And the outcome of the game was glorious for a Pacers fan. See, they won 136 to 94. And that was the greatest margin of defeat that LeBron James has experienced in his entire career. Now, the joy of the game, though, was more than just in the score. See, for a couple days before the game, rumors had started to swirl that the Lakers are looking to trade some of their players in order to make space to acquire another superstar along with LeBron James. And so, three minutes into the game, as Brandon Ingram, one of the Lakers players, is at the free throw line, Pacers fans start chanting throughout the arena, LeBron's gonna trade you. And they did it over and over. Now, LeBron James is just a player. He has no ability to decide who is traded and who is not. But, as some of you may know from his time in Cleveland, LeBron often gets the reputation as being the one in charge of the team. And so the players were mocking Brandon Ingram, saying that LeBron doesn't like him, doesn't care about him, and is wanting to get rid of him. Now, mocking pretty common in sports. We may call it taunting or simply cheering for your own team, but mocking, especially beyond sports, isn't always good-natured. In fact, sometimes it can be downright cruel, especially in a biblical context. For we heard the story about how Samson experienced an extreme level of mocking in the story earlier. The Philistines, they had captured him, they had shaved off his hair, gouged out his eyes, and bound him with bronze shackles. They threw him in prison then and forced him to work hard labor to grind the wheat. And all of this while mocking him constantly that his God could not protect him anymore. And then, as we heard in our text, there was a sacrifice the Philistines were making to their god Dagon and made a public spectacle of Samson himself. 3,000 were watching from the rooftop on that day as Samson, the bald and blind guy, was forced to dance for them and entertain them as a joke. But God is not mocked, and neither is the one he chooses and appoints to rescue his people. And so as Samson is placed between the two pillars, one pillar on his left hand and one on his right, he brings down the entire building upon unsuspecting Philistines and grants a great and glorious victory for the Israelites. But the story includes his own self-sacrifice. Sure, he brings the temple or the, uh, the building down upon uh, himself and therefore killing himself while at the same time bringing victory to his people. See, in death, Samson won the greatest and unsuspected victory over the Philistines. But the mocking continues. This time it was a shepherd boy who had no armor and simply a shepherd's pouch. And with five smooth stones and with a sling in his hand, the wordless David approached the great and giant Goliath, who was well-armed and mocking constantly. In fact, Goliath thought David was simply a joke that he would come out to him like that. And so with a good belly laugh, he mocked David in 1 Samuel 17 by even declaring, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And yet God is not mocked, and neither is the one he chooses and anoints to rescue his people. The joke was on Goliath and upon the Philistines. As God gave David courage to confront Goliath, and God gave David the faith 
and the expert aim to knock down that giant with one smooth stone. He slung it at Goliath, brought him down, and the joke was ultimately on Goliath himself. And then the part that we really don't tell the kids in Sunday school, you remember how it ends? How David goes up to Goliath and grabs his own sword and cuts off his own head and then carries that head around as if it were a trophy for himself. See, God is not mocked, and neither is the one that he chooses and anoints to rescue the world. But tonight, we hear how Jesus is mocked. God's anointed, the Messiah, the King of kings, the one sent from heaven to rescue the world. Jesus is made a laughingstock and a public spectacle as the soldiers make sport of him. Sure enough, he was stripped and crowned with thorns, and a mock scepter was placed in his hands. And they had a good belly laugh before him as they knelt before him, made fun of him, insulted him, spit upon him, and even struck him in the head. But God is not mocked. At least that's what we've been told. And tonight we see the opposite happening. Which leads to many questions, doesn't it? Is, is this where God's anointed finally says he's had enough? Is this where God's anointed shows his divine strength in his right hand and in his left hand and seeks revenge upon those that cause such great pain? Is this where Jesus shows who he is and pushes the mockers back upon their own heads and takes them out? Is this where we finally see the payback that we've been waiting for forever? But the scene doesn't culminate in victory like that. And it doesn't culminate in victory for the Lord's anointed either. As we heard at the beginning of the sermon. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Jesus puts up no fight. And in the face of mockery, he flashes no divine power or revenge. Instead, he humbly submits to the insults that they continue to declare. He doesn't cry out. He doesn't lash out. And that's good news for all who have ever mocked God. That's good news for you and me. For Jesus has come to save sinners. And Jesus bears all disrespect, all blasphemy, all mockery. And we can imagine what would happen if he would have used his divine strength, if he would have got revenge on the soldiers of that day. And we can imagine what he would do to anyone who ever mocked him, even to today. And that's a dangerous thought because we have. Sure, we've rolled our eyes at the demands of God's law. We've scoffed at what he wants us to do and imagined it's only impossible or just a mere suggestion. We've mocked him as we have no fear of him or not considered Jesus to be trustworthy or we pray to him as if he's just another bellboy to fetch us our needs instead of the king of kings. We looked down upon him or judged him with contempt and with a smug and disrespectful attitude as if he was even worthy of our time. We've taken sin too lightly and judged his church, his bride, too harshly. And we've even taken sin and treated it as if it's just another mistake of judgment and not a condition of estrangement from God. After all, God is love, and so therefore, sin's just another thing, and he really doesn't care. And Jesus bears all of that. And he bears it willingly and silently, and most obviously, he shows us God's love for sinners. For God, in the person of Jesus, is mocked, and he's willingly mocked in order to rescue you. And he absorbs in his holy flesh all mockery, all disrespect, all the sin that you can dish out. And he takes it to the cross to destroy it, to rescue you from the dead, not with revenge, not with payback, not to mock you for your sin or hold it before you ever again. For Jesus, through his death and resurrection, comes 
to proclaim peace. Or as we talked about last Sunday, comes to proclaim reconciliation. And he willingly was led to the cross and to the grave to destroy all sin, to destroy your sin, to spare you from Satan's eternal mocking as he seeks to remind us of the sins that we have. And if you think about it, go back to even Jesus' birth. Matthew chapter 2, and he, when he's just a, a couple years old, when the magi, the wise men, appear in Jesus' presence. These are Gentiles, the wise men. And they surround the young Jesus, and they fell down on their knees and worshipped him and hailed him as king of the Jews. And now at this side of his life, we see it at the birth, Now, near his death, in his passion, he's surrounded by Gentile soldiers once again. And as verse 28 reminded us that kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And Jesus receives this greeting, but seeks no retribution. For he came into the world for this, to find glory in the mocking as the crucified king. For our king was crowned with ugly thorns and was atoned for crooked thoughts that you've had about God or about his teachings and about his truth. And our king crowns you with glory and honor. Our king was dressed in a scarlet robe and yet our king baptizes you and then adorns you with his royal garb and covers your scarlet sins. Our king held in his hands a mock scepter as he was continuously mocked, and yet our king delivers into your hands his body and his blood shed for you, so that through his death he brings down Satan and his power over you. See, Jesus is greater than Samson. For he stretched out his right hand and his left hand upon the cross for you. And Jesus is greater than David. He didn't use five smooth stones, but instead has five jagged wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side. And he crushed Satan's head and gives you a share of his victory, a victory that is eternal. See, Jesus is God in the flesh, and he was mercilessly mocked so that he may mercifully declare grace to you once again. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, we gather our tithes and offerings.